Aloha, my name is Anne Kiala Kelly, and welcome to the show. We're in the studio today with Dr. David Keanu Sai. Aloha, Keanu. Aloha. Thanks for being on the show. Glad to be invited. It's been a great week. This is what, Thursday? Yeah. So this has been a really, really interesting week uh, so far, and it's not over yet. Monday, I want to talk first about Monday. There was a press conference, and you were part of the press conference. In fact, you were one of the people who answered some questions. Mm -hmm. But it was really a press conference called by Professor Williamson Chang right. and at the UH Law School. So can you talk a little bit about what that press conference was about and why he was doing it? Sure. It, uh, it started off with the, uh, the newspaper article that came out um, where Rob Perez uh, disclosed that a memo had been written for OHA by myself. I was contracted and alleging and war crimes. When was this article and what paper was it in? This article must have been about maybe oof, August, August 20 something, uh, okay. maybe the third week of August. Okay. I remember this, right. It was in the Honolulu Star Bulletin. It was on, a su it was on the on Sunday, Sunday paper. paper, right. Yeah, front page. Yeah. And it mentioned that uh, OHA memo implies nation building, uh, implies uh, war crimes, you know, so that's pretty big. You know, but the way the, the, the tenor of the article itself was very subjective. Uh, Rob Perez did a terrible job. Uh, he didn't do any investigative reporting. He tried to make it appear as if myself and Kamana Opono, Dr. Kamana Opono, were in collusion somehow, uh -huh. you know, well, in drafting wait, this memo. But wait a second. Let's talk about which, we're talking about the memo, right? right? The one that prompted the letter that Dr. Crabb sent to Well, the actually, secretary. the memo didn't prompt the letter. Okay. Actually, the letter was sent before the memo was made. Oh, I didn't know that. Interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So when I was brought in, I was asked to uh, advise Dr. Kamano Pono Crab on allegations of war crimes mm -hmm. that, that we're speaking to at, on, at the April 17th uh, uh, symposium that I was a part of with Professor Williamson Chang. And, at the um, law school. And former Governor John Wahe. Right. Okay. And that's where former Governor John Wahe stated on the record that, you know, he, he knows why he's occupied. He said, you have to be illiterate not to know that. Yeah, he said, everyone knows it's occupied. You have to be illiterate not to know that. Right. right. So what That's I spoke former to Former governor, why, hey, hey. Yeah. Now, what I spoke to was the consequences of being occupied. And war crimes come to play. Okay. And war crimes are crimes committed against individuals, not against the country. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. So certain war crimes that I spoke of that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs would be uh, committing is pillaging. Well, should I say not pillaging, but receiving monies from pillaging. Okay. Meaning from the state. So the collection of taxes from the state of Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, it should be legal if it's a real government. But because the state of Hawaii was created by an act of Congress for territory outside of the United States, because there is no evidence that Hawaii is a part of the United States first, then the state of Hawaii government cannot claim to be legal. They actually are this in the same position as the provisional government, where President Cleveland declared them to be neither de facto nor de jure, but self-proclaimed. That status has not changed today. So now when a self-proclaimed entity called the state of Hawaii government starts to collect taxes, you can't call that taxes anymore. That's called theft. It's called looting. You're forcing people to pay you mm -hmm. monies. Mm -hmm. It's called unlawful appropriation of property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, unlawfully, okay? Now, what's important there is looting or theft, that's another word for pillaging. So pillaging is the international term for theft. And it falls under the war crimes? It falls under the definition of what is a war crime. Because there are many other war crimes. Yes, yes. So this is one. Now, war crimes are not a general term that applies to everything. Okay. Okay, so regarding Hawaii and the United States, and in particular, Title 18, Section 2441, which I cited in my memorandum, mm -hmm. that falls under the United States Criminal Code. Wait, Title so 18. let me just back up again. The memorandum, you were asked to write this memorandum after the symposium and after the letter. Yeah, okay, okay. you're right. Let's get back to the letter. Right. So Dr. Crabb sent the letter to, to try to establish the fact that there are no crimes or, or allegations of crimes that are being committed that I spoke to. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why he sent the letter to Secretary of State Kerry to see if Secretary of State Kerry could refute the evidence that says the kingdom still exists, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. meaning prove it doesn't exist. Right. Because if you don't prove, if you can't prove that it doesn't exist, then he has to presume that it exists, and now he has to comply with the law of occupation and Hawaiian Kingdom law. What would be the proof of, of 
it existing? What would be the proof that this is part of the United States? You need a treaty. Treaty of annexation. You need a treaty, an agreement, some agreement between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States whereby the United States acquired the sovereignty and territory of the Hawaiian Kingdom. You don't have that. All you have is a joint resolution passed by Congress during at the height of the Spanish-American War seizing Hawaii. That is not annexation or should I say that is not cession of territory. That is seizure of territory. And since then the United States Congress has continued to apply its laws in Hawaii without first having acquired Hawaii having acquired Hawaii by a treaty. And, and, and as, so in other words, they're occupying, is what you're saying, that's what you're asserting, and that's what the letter to Kerry was about, was questioning whether or not this is an occupation, can you clarify? And that's right. my research, that's my right. PhD. That's your PhD. That's my larger in articles. Mm -hmm. I've done a very exhaustive analysis, legal, political, historical. Uh, it's clear, mm -hmm. Hawaii is not a part of the United States. What we have is, um, a propaganda campaign that was initiated here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, institutionally, in Hawaii, starting, I can, I can pick a date now, 1906. That's when all the schools throughout the Hawaiian Islands turned into English immersion schools and began to brainwash through inculcation, they call it. Okay? Inculcation is, is indoctrination through repetition. Meaning Americanization, though. It was about it Americanizing, was Americanizing Hawaiians. And even that, is that a war crime? Denationalization or attempts to denationalize uh, inhabitants of an occupied territory, yes, it is a war crime. So now we have two that we just talked about. Well, it's not a war crime as recognized under Section 2441 of the U.S. Uh, Federal, Federal Criminal Code. Exactly. Right. right. But it is a war crime that, is recognized, that was recognized since 1919 during World War I mm -hmm. and also part of the Nuremberg trials. Right. Other countries like Australia, uh, Great Britain, um, I believe China as well they uh, enacted denationalization as a war crime and began to prosecute individuals after World War II mm -hmm. for denationalization, mm -hmm. which came under um, Italianization, mm -hmm. Germanization, and Japanization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we're talking about Americanization. Okay, so let's get back to the memo. Okay. So at what point were you asked to write a memo? I was actually asked to write the memo and I was brought in to advise on, to, to well, prior to uh, Dr. Crabb sending the letter out. Now, what Dr. Crabb wanted was information mm -hmm. for him to make a decision yeah, and pass it on to the trustees because mm -hmm. OHA has no information, no research, nothing regarding international law and Hawaii. Why is that? Excuse me, but that's a little odd because they're the Hawaiian agency and we're Hawaiians and this is Hawaiian stuff. Why would they not have this kind of stuff at their fingertips? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, and he admitted they don't have. Okay. All they have is uh, opinions on federal recognition. Um, they have federal lobbyists in Washington. They have nothing or had nothing on international law regarding Hawaii and the impact that OHA uh, would have within this framework of public international law. Okay, so you're brought in, you're asked to write a memo, which by the way, how long did it take you to actually produce this memo for them? I would say uh, about three weeks. Oh wow, that's a long time. So the, the letter was put out May 5th, dated May 5th, to Secretary of State Kerry. Mm -hmm. My memo was completed May 24th. Okay. And so it's all kind of happening almost around the same time. There's a buzz in OHA at that time. People are asking questions, legal questions, about right. whether or not the issue of war crimes actually should be addressed by the agency. So the letter goes out. You write this memo, which I understand is something like 40 pages long. Yep, yep. 43 okay. pages. Now, let's just go up to that article in August by, was it Rob Perez? Right. So you were talking about that at the beginning of the show. Well, from May 24th until that article, uh, Dr. Crabb was, was doing his best to ensure that the trustees were fully aware of the memo. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not done in secret. He wanted to, and he provided, to, er, provided a copy of the memo to all the trustees. And uh, in fact, one of the trustees, Bob Lindsay, said he read their memo 10 times. Ten times. He kept going over and over. Why? Did he say why? Um, from what I understand, he, well, he had to. I mean, it's, it's, it was contracted by OHA, so they're looking into it. And um, he wanted to make it an issue, and so did Dan Ahuna, make it an issue before the trustees. From what I gather, you know, I can't say specifically, but for not, from what I gather, um, there was a deliberate move not to address it in the meetings regarding the memo. It was almost as if it was silence. 
they don't want to go on the record. Because those meetings yeah. are all on the record. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't attended any of these meetings. But okay. it would never come up. Okay. It would never come up. All right. That's now, the problem here is, and this is my concern that I have with Dr. Crabb, Section 4 of Title 18 of the Criminal Code states that if you have evidence of a felony, which a war crime is a felony under the Federal Criminal Code, you have to report it You're as soon as You're talking under federal law. Federal law. Okay. Now, Section 2441, which defines a war crime, okay, mm -hmm. as a grave breach of the Geneva Conventions, or Article 28 in particular of the Hague Convention, which specifically addresses unlawful appropriation of property and pillaging, which makes it a felony, okay, which means you can spend more than a year in prison, up to life, or the death penalty, you have to report a felony as soon as possible. So what I was recommending to Dr. Crabb was, you need to send this back up to the State Department. <laughs> because what you have in your hands now is the evidence. What you had prior to this was the allegations. So the evidence is there. You have to send it. And from what I gather, Dr. Crabb had a very difficult time uh, sending it because uh, the way it appeared, the trustees were not going to allow that. Like yeah. they can block that. They ended up, well, I think... Now when we speak of the article written by Rob Perez, mm -hmm. it could speak to that because Rob Perez heard of a memo that I drafted and was trying to get a copy of the memo. Did he ever contact you and ask you for a copy? Uh, well, actually, called, he contacted me after he got the copy. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. But at first, he couldn't get the copy from the Office of Foreign Affairs for his story. Um, he was told, this is what he told me, he was told that it was attorney-client privilege because the memo spoke to strategies on nation building. Okay. Now, it doesn't. First of all, it's not, it doesn't fall under the attorney-client privilege because I did not write that as an, as an attorney. I know. I'm a political yeah. scientist. Right. It's a memo. Okay. And strategies for nation building? No. That memo didn't speak to nation building. That memo spoke to the fact that the Hawaiian Kingdom as a nation still exists. It's under occupation. Here's the evidence of war crimes. Mm -hmm basically providing the basis for uh, the Secretary of State to refute. You just gave them more material to work with, though. You gave some backup to why the letter that he sent was important. Yeah. And you informed everybody at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs that they had the information. As you said, Trustee Lindsay said he read it 10 times. It's probably some dense material because, sure. you know, this stuff is an easy reading. Yeah. Okay. So, circling back to that article, just so that we can move on to the press conference, Okay, no, before okay. we get to the press okay. conference. So, Rob Perez, he was only able to get the memo, a copy of the memo, when he requested it under the Freedom of Information Act. Okay. That's when OHA released it. Now, that doesn't look good for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs because it shows that they were concealing something. Now, when the evidence is the evidence of a war crime or felonies, that more so doesn't look good. Okay. Now, I don't believe that the Office of Foreign Affairs fully understood the requirements of Section 4 of Title 18, that you're supposed to report it. Well, they have a, a team of lawyers, don't they? I would think so. Okay. We don't know for sure. But I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All right. Now, once it was released, that's when Professor Chang was able to get a copy of the memo. And he reviewed the memo, and he and I spoke. And when I shared with him my concern for the Office of Foreign Affairs, to report this because of Section 4, Professor Chang read the statute and he realized he was just as responsible to report the crime as the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was. And that's what prompted Professor Chang to, to, to report the crime of felonies mm -hmm. that haven't continued to be committed in Hawaii mm -hmm. because he also found himself in the same position as the Office of Hawaiian Affairs in receipt of stolen money. He's a faculty member of the University of Hawaii Richardson School of Law. Mm -hmm. He gets paid by the state of Hawaii, which comes out of the general fund, which monies are acquired through taxation, which is now considered looting or pillaging. So Professor Chang drafted the letter, and um, uh, he had 18, well, I think 17 or 18 state of Hawaii officials. From which, you know, agencies in the state? Uh, they the co-signers, right? The Department of uh, Human Services, the Department of Public Safety, um, the fire department of Maui, 
uh, faculty members at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, Windward Community College, as well as Maui College. You know, so it was a, it was a diverse group of state officials and employees. Yeah. Who co-signed the letter. Yeah. I, I read the letter, and the letter was really well written, or is really well written. Is it, is it on your website, by the way? Yep, it's okay. on the website. So well, not my website, but the blog, the Hawaii Kingdom blog, right. Yep. Um, so I thought it was very well written. It's really an inquiry, and it's at, at the end of the letter, he's saying, you know, can you answer these questions or refute uh, the evidence right. in sometime in the next two weeks? Right. I thought that was interesting to put kind of a time on it. I know about the two weeks. Okay. He spoke to me about that. Okay. Because of the severity of the situation, this is not something that you leave it open-ended. You want a timeline mm -hmm. because this doesn't only affect the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. It affects every State of Hawaii employee and official. Everyone. You know? mm -hmm. Everyone. And, and it's not something that can be pushed under the rug. Now, this war crime of pillaging it's just one of many more that could be applied to the state of Hawaii, which could also include for law enforcement, mm -hmm. unlawful confinement. Mm -hmm. Unlawful confinement is a grave breach of the Geneva Convention Number no. 4, which is a war crime as defined under Section 2441. So in, uh, in uh, one of the signatories, well, actually two of them, were law enforcement. One was a particular sergeant in the sheriff's department, and one was a deputy sheriff. Now, they are concerned because if they arrest people, unlawful confinement, then they would get hit with an additional war crime. So the key here is, for the United States Department of Justice, they have to refute the evidence. You can't sit on it. You have to refute it because war crimes have and continue be, to be reported. I mean, not to be reported, uh, continue to be committed. Right, and they're being reported as well and they're now, being reported. Right. Um, yeah. little by little that's coming out. Which, by the way, I have to just touch on this, because the Attorney General, Eric Holder Jr., is the highest officer in the land, right, as far as law. Right. Right. And today he announced that he is resigning. I heard that. And I <laughs> thought that was really interesting, given the events that have unfolded over the past few months in Hawaii. Yeah. And, and you know, someone put this out on, on the Internet today, and I just want to... <laughs> just go down this uh, little timeline sure. that, lead, that ends with the Eric Holder uh, resignation. So on May 5th, Office of Hawaiian Affairs CEO Dr. Kamana Opono Crab sends letter to U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. May 9th, Office of Hawaiian Affairs Board of Trustees rescind Dr. Crab's letter to John Kerry. June 18th, U.S. Department of Interior announces schedule of hearings in Hawaii for tribal recognition of Aboriginal Hawaiians. June 23rd to August 7th, these hearings take place. August 5th, formal request by you, Dr. Sai, to Assistant Secretary of Insular Affairs for the U.S. Department of Interior, Esther Kia'aina, requesting an exhaustive legal analysis from the Department of State, Office of Legal Counsel, to show the Hawaiian Kingdom was extinguished under international law. This is good stuff. And it's a fast read. Yeah. August 10th, Assistant Secretary of Policy Management and Budget for the Department of Interior, Rhea Su, stated to Dr. Sai, you, that Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell, was forward forwarded a copy of the letter and that they will be making a direct request to the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel to respond to his letter, to your letter. August 11th, Honolulu Civil Beat publishes open letter from you, Dr. Sai, to Assistant Secretary of Insular Affairs for the U.S. Department of Interior, Esther Kia'aina. August 19th, revelation that State of Hawaii judge, now personally, I think he needs to go on the record with this, but it was revealed that State of Hawaii judge Harry Freitas received we don't know if he received a warrant or he was found, found out he, there, there was a warrant for him to appear before the International Criminal Court for the war crime of willfully depriving plaintiffs of a fair and regular trial under Hawaiian Kingdom law as prescribed by the Fourth Geneva Convention. September 17th, Professor Chang sends letter to U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder reporting war crimes in Hawaii. Announcement that Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior, Interior Reyes Su, will be replaced. September 22nd, Professor Chang holds press conference regarding a September 17th letter to the U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. And then it, uh, Hawaiian Homes Commissioner Joe Tassel calls for moratorium on ex uh, evictions from Department of Hawaiian Homelands or from the Homelands uh, homesteads until Eric Holder answers Professor Chang's letter. Announcement that Head Admiral of the U.S. Pacific Command Samuel Locklear 
will be replaced. <laughs> this is all like on the 22nd. September, it's a busy day. Wow. It's been a busy week. As I said, it's I, been a busy week. I didn't week. realize that. September 23rd, ABC News Australia reports on Professor Tang's letter to U.S. Attorney General Holder. Was that two days ago? September 25th. Oh, and that was actually an interview with Dexter Kayama. Mm -hmm. And then they included the report of the letter. Um, so ABC News Australia is actually doing a really good job covering a lot sure, of the stuff yeah. that's been going on. September 25th, announcement that the U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder will be replaced. Interesting. And, uh, and then... At the bottom, it says October 1st, deadline for U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder to, to answer Professor Chang's letter. You know, I'm sorry I don't have the name of the person that did this. I will not take credit for it, but it's a beautiful timeline, and it's out there on Facebook. And well, I'm, from I'm, May until From now. May 5th <laughs> until, actually, the future, October 1st. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful timeline. And, yeah. and the reason that I'm, I'm reading that is because I think I want to go back to this press conference. Okay. There was no press except Hawaiian press, Hawaiian people, and not even certain Hawaiian reporters weren't there. Right. Um, so Hawaiians were covering their own story, which is something that we have to just get used to doing because we're really not going to find our story in the other press. Um, and uh, oh, what was the other thing I wanted to say about that, about the press conference, is that I, found, I find it interesting that it happened at the law school and this is, I, I guess for me, doing the press conference there and then having it be P Professor Chang's conference opens up this great opportunity mm -hmm. for the, the law school at the University of Hawaii to take a lead and maybe hold a public debate or symposiums or a series of serious conversations about law in Hawaii. What is and isn't legitimate? What is and isn't legal? Right. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering if you know anything about that because I'm, I think we should, somebody should ask them to do that because it seems like the most logical, that's the most logical place to do that, have that dialogue. It is. And Professor Chang stated that in his conference, at the press conference. Um, and I also reiterated what he said. Now, we have to be careful though in how this information is presented because if you present this information and you have somebody who doesn't believe in it and they're wrong and they start to speak against it, then it could look like they are an accessory after the fact in concealing the truth and evidence of a crime. Now, if you keep it academic, if you keep it historical, if you keep it political science and legal within the academic world, I think it's a great opportunity for the, for the University of Hawaii to engage, not just the law school, but all the disciplines at the mm -hmm. University of Hawaii. In fact, the law school um, has already been engaged, and I think some of the professors there don't realize that. Um, for my uh, doctoral dissertation, my committee, um, Avi Soifer, the dean of the law school, was on my committee, and his background is U.S. constitutional law. And what did okay. he think of your dissertation? Uh, well, well, when you defend a dissertation, you're not asking anybody to agree with you. You got to defend it. <laughs> you know, so what they're trying to do is break it. Okay. <laughs> so whenever you do a dissertation defense. It's not a dissertation argument, <laughs> meaning they are throwing balls at you to break it. And that's the function. That, that's called rigor. That, okay. That's the way the system works. Mm -hmm. um, but he signed off on my dissertation because he obviously couldn't find anything in it that was wrong. Yeah? So it's not a matter of, oh, I agree. It's more like I it's can't strong, deny. It's a strong argument. It, and that it's becomes, and, and, and then once you pass the, the PhD, and once you pass and you're awarded the PhD, then you're the expert in that area. Because what a PhD is, is something original to contribute within the discipline. You don't have PhDs on the same topic. Well, you have a lot of PhDs on the same topic, just not on this topic. No. I mean, you have a no. thousand PhDs no. in the English departments. No. and not topic and subject. You don't. Because before you get a PhD, you have to write a proposal. Yes, and your proposal has to show that this is original. You're not replicating somebody else's research. Okay, all right. And if it is somebody else's research that you're trying to replicate, you've got to prove them wrong because you don't have duplicated uh, PhDs. If you do, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> you, you actually defy the whole process. Can, then you make PhDs a dime a dozen. PhDs are supposed to be original to contribute. I know they're supposed to be original to contribute. We can get into a big old argument about whether you know, academia is legitimate in that way, because yes, of course they should be original, but I'm saying some areas of study, maybe it's not, maybe there's a lot of repetition. Yours obviously is original. You're the first person doing this Kind no, of no, 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 we gotta get this uh, straight okay. because I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea off the, on the okay. show. A, a dissertation 
is a research on a particular topic and subject. Yes. Okay. In political science, it also varies from political theory, comparative politics, public law. Uh, you have to get into the particulars because once you get into the particulars, that's the basis on how you're going to defend it. Okay. Yes. Okay. So in this particular case, my dissertation focused on Hawaii's legal and political history. Correct. Nobody else ever did that. I know. Okay. I understand that. Yeah. Yes. So that's very clear. So when you get into these issues, okay, regarding um, um, legal matters, I needed legal people on my committee. That's why the dean of the law school was on it. Okay. Okay. That's why political scientists were on my committee who have a law background. And he signed okay. off on it, and the political scientists signed off on it in your PhD. And I also had another uh, 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 member on my committee whose background was international law and state sovereignty, and that was from the University of London, from Great Britain. All right. So their job is to look into it to try to break it. Okay. If it can't be broken, they grant it. So that's why I got my PhD. Right, right. Now you also and you're defending it still, <laughs> right? No, I mean, I know, but I'm just saying I, it's... But I'm, I'm actually not defending my PhD. What right. I'm doing is I'm defending my research and my work. Okay. And I, that's why PhDs are normally called in for expert witness, right. testifi testifying, and so forth. But you're saying that what you're trying to say is that the law school, your work's already no, no. known. So, no, no. So let me continue. Okay, because we have one minute left. That's why I'm... There's also um, a, another political scientist who just recently re graduated, uh, Willie Kawai. Yes. He also had two more professors from the law school on his committee, Melody McKenzie and Chuck Lawrence. Right. So the law school is connected to this issue. Yeah. Yes. And it's a perfect opportunity to keep that going. Okay. You know, so it's not new for the law school. It's just new information for everybody else to see, like, wait, wait a minute. Maybe the law school should be involved. I completely agree. Because it would be they're great. They're already involved. It would be great. They should they're get involved already, more. They're already involved. It would yeah. be great if they would take the lead. Yeah. Maybe with you, maybe with pr Professor Chang, yeah. and create some kind of a discussion that really takes these issues on, especially this issue of war crime. We have 20 seconds left, so what would you like people to uh, look into with regard to the issue of war crimes in Hawaii? I think the best thing is looking to uh, getting more information. I would say go to hawaiiankingdom.org mm -hmm. slash blog. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of information there. Um, just read, talk, discuss, share. Okay. That's the key. All right. Well, mahalo nui for coming on the show. I mean, this was a really great conversation, and we'll see you again sometime soon, I hope. Okay, mahalo for tuning in. Ahoi ho, malama pono.